Good evening, everyone. I do believe we're live. Uh, how's everybody doing tonight? Welcome to another version of Shimano School. I'm here with our good friend, Seth Funt. Seth, how you doing, bud? I'm doing great, JP. Thanks for having me on tonight. I'm excited. Oh, to be great. Here. No, we missed you the last time because you guys had like a hurricane or something blow through there and you were out of power. You were out of Wi-Fi. So we got you to ourselves tonight. Yeah, I'm so, excited. We're looking forward to this. Um, yeah. For everybody tuning in, we're going to be talking deep drop. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Seth, Seth is really one of the pioneers on daytime sword fishing. And uh, I, I got a chance to meet him a couple of years ago at ICAST for the first time. And he is uh, very technical. There's a ton of information you're going to be able to learn tonight. So get your questions ready. And like always, I love when you guys jump in here and let me know where you're coming in from. So in the comment section, let me know where you're checking in from. Uh, we are talking deep drop from north to south, but it applies, Seth kind of everywhere, doesn't it? Anywhere they deep drop fish. Yeah, around the world. In fact, uh, we we're just sending some gear out to London, uh, stuff to Spain, the Seychelles Islands, Africa, Australia, um, New Zealand. Uh, it's a global fishery. So, And what's unique about this fishery is that it's one of the only fisheries that's really undiscovered. So there's parts of the world that are just discovering it now and, and just getting dialed into it, and the options are limitless. For where you can do it and, and how you can use Shimano equipment around the, around the world. And that's one of the things we want to touch on tonight. It's just getting through some of the basics so that you can become a little bit more proficient with some of the gear that Shimano offers. All right. So that's where we're going to head with it tonight, folks. So again, do me a favor. If you've got a buddy who's into deep drop fishing or sword fishing, or it's a bucket list fish, which it is for so many people in the world, tag them in the comment section. That's going to get them over here. This video is going to live here on the Shimano Facebook page. It's also going to be living on our YouTube channel. So for everybody who's watching on YouTube, I welcome you guys as well tonight. So please check in uh, with us. Let me know where you're checking in from. Blaine Anderson's in the house. Um, he said, thanks for helping cr uh, in cracking the code here in South Carolina. So apparently they're having some success in a really untapped fishery down there, aren't they? It's truly one of the most amazing fisheries. That's, that's really untapped. And uh, as you follow that bathymetric chart all the way up the coast, South Carolina is one of those untouched gems that uh, people are now just discovering. So it's going to be interesting to see how that fishery unfolds over the next couple of years as, as more and more people get interested in the fishery. So I've experienced a little bit of seeing it's it's the run there that keeps it untouched, isn't it, Seth? It's the distance. It's not like that deep water is close to shore like it is on so many places along that east coast it's a you're 60 80 miles aren't you to get out there i think the pivotal switch really has been um some of the newer center consoles and the engines and the boat manufacturers that are out there are really uh building high performance boats that allow you to travel long distances in a short amount of time and you know to go daytime sword fishing and run uh 60 80 100 120 150 miles i did a trip last week um and do it for the day is, is truly remarkable. And up until the last, say, 10 years, that wasn't possible. Right. So it's all something that's just emerging now. And, um, you, you know, we get questions from around the world. How can we get better at this? Where can we do it? And, uh, you know, the evolution of the sport fishing fishery is is definitely something that's that's pushing the envelope of what's possible out there. Awesome. So we got guys checking in. Paul Powis, obviously my boy from up here, from Erie, Ontario. Roy Leva's checking in. Uh, we've got Mark Phelps. How you doing, Mark? Jim Hendricks from SoCal. Uh, John Allen said, what up, brother? Uh, Jane from Brainerd, Minnesota. Scott Ed Edgar from Real Alaska Fishing Charters. Uh, we are happy to support you guys out there. Uh, Chris Oliver from the Gulf of Maine. And John Allen from Team Three Boys getting it done. So let's talk swordfish first and foremost because this is fascinating to me Seth I've never uh, experienced it I know you've invited me down several times to to check out what it is and I'm seeing the popularity of deep drop and swordfish is growing it's definitely one of the techniques and fisheries that's on the upswing um, but for those of you who haven't seen anything about it you know swordfish also known as broadbills in some countries uh, highly are large highly migratory Predatory fish characterized by a long, flat-pointed bill. I mean, it seems basic enough, but I think the highly migratory thing, Seth, what is it? Are they constantly on the move, these fish? Yeah, they tag these fish in South Florida, and they travel to 
uh, north of Nova Scotia and over to the Mediterranean and then make their way uh, through the loop currents that travel around the world. And, and it's truly remarkable fish. There are no boundaries to this fish. And Seems parallel to a bluefin. Is it very parallel to a bluefin tuna in the way that they travel as well? Uh, totally different fish. Um, the expanse of this fish is completely unknown. So, you know, one thing that we got to consider is that the habitat of this fish is the bottom of the ocean. And the bottom of the ocean is fairly consistent in the temperature. So if you think about it that way, um, whether you go from Florida to Nova Scotia or Europe or South America, the bottom at 17, 18, 19, 2,000 feet of water, it's, it's approximately the same temperature. So as long as there's food there, there's fish there. And, you know, the more we study them, the more we figure out how little we really know about them. All right. And so uh, this I found kind of interesting. So it's round bodied and elongated, but they lose all their teeth and scales by adulthood. So they start out scaled, you mentioned to me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. When their juvenile stage, they'll start out as a fry fish and they'll, uh, they have some different fisheries around the world that are classified as um, nurseries. So the Gulf of Mexico, South Florida, Straits of Florida, these are known habitats that are, um, you know, nurseries for these fish. But once they get into adulthood, really it, it, the, the traveling that these fish do is, is, is quite remarkable. I mean, they can travel up to two, 3000 miles in a year. Wow. All right. And so, uh, and very widely said you, so you mentioned that bottom temperatures are the same. They can be anywhere in the world. The bottom temperature of the ocean is basically the same. So mm -hmm. parts of the Atlantic Pacific Indian oceans, I mean, uh, through tagging, you mentioned that they have no, there's like very little information on what these fish are capable of. The satellite tag data that's out there now suggests that, you know, these fish have an up and down migration, but beyond that, we don't know where they breed. We don't know how frequently they breed. We don't, you know, really know too much about them. Um, we kind of know the habitats that they live in, but, you know, it's one of those fish that's out there that's, that's really highly difficult to study just because of where it lives. And it, it's a fun fish to go and target because it's something different and unique. And that's really what attracts me to it. All right. We've got two left here. So it can be found from the surface to over 1,800 feet of water. Uh, right. So really, what's the deepest that you've heard of them being recorded at through, through the tagging? So there's two parts of this, uh, JP. You know, one part of it, it's... Uh, practice, which is, you know, I, I know what I see just based on the fishery that's accept, you know, that's accessible to me. But then the other part of this is the science part of it. And, uh, you know, I always find it interesting to log on to NOAA and see that these fish are spotted by the O'Shea, um, or I, I should say the, the uh, you know, the rovers that study the bottom of the ocean see these fish, you know, anywhere from 6,000 feet all the way to the surface. So yeah. it, it, they're limitless and they're one of the only fish that can travel from the surface to the bottom and back up in almost, you know, a very short amount of time and not many fish in the ocean can do that. Okay. And that's where you're getting that 2,234 meter depths. So that's 6,700 feet basically. So yeah. Or deep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Massive range. So, okay. And then last, lastly, uh, IGFA all tackle angling record, 536 kilos or 1,182 pounds. Chile in 1953. Seth, is it going to get broken? What do you think? Oh, will it ever get broken? Maybe. Yeah, I think it could get, it definitely could get broken. Yes. I think uh, there's some people that I collaborate with that often send me pictures and I've seen swordfish well over that weight. So wow. will it qualify as an IGFA fish? I hope so. But I do believe that there's a, there, there's fish that are much larger than that that are out there. We just need to go find out where they're at and how you can land them. But, but a fish that size is very difficult to catch just based on its sheer size. And, you know, the attitude of this fish is very different from a lot of the other fish that live in the world. I, you know, Guy Harvey says it's the only fish you won't get in the water with. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. That says a lot right there. So, well, uh, all. Ixvius gladius, the gladiator of the ocean. There you go. Uh, we got Charlotte, North Carolina checking in. We got a few other people checking in. Barry, how you doing? Andy, uh, Sang, uh, Jim, I hope you guys are all doing well tonight. So tonight is our 
uh, I guess a bi-weekly episode of Shimano School with Seth Punt. We're talking deep drop and sailfish. We went through some quick sailfish stats here, but Seth is really, where we're going to pick his brain tonight is on A to Z getting started in deep drop or sword fishing. So Seth, I think the first thing we want to start with is probably the gear one person will need to, to do this. Uh, this isn't something you're going to go out there with a, you know, a, a 30 wide, or you're going to go out there with, you know, just any old reel and rod. It's a very specified thing, is it not? Uh, you, you need you need some very specific gear. Luckily, Shimano makes the equipment right out of the box that's ready to go. So, you know, whether you're just getting into the fishery or you're an expert, you can be fairly confident that the gear right out of the box is going to perform to the standards that it needs to to catch these fish. All right. And for reels, what are we starting with? So I would say a great beginner reel for this fishery. And I, I'm going to take that a step further and say, you know, now that we've been doing it now almost 15 years, almost exclusively, I would say that the Beastmaster is one of the reels that you can go pick it up at your local dealer, spool the reel up, and that reel is capable of catching almost anything that the ocean's going to throw at you. Uh, mainly, mainly because the maximum drag output is further than anything you're ever going to need to catch this fish. And the other piece of it is that um, the capacity of the reel allows you to go and target fish at these depths, um, you know, in comfort. You'll be able to target these fish down at 15, 16, 17, 1800 feet, have plenty of line capacity and plenty of drag capacity to catch the fish. And just to take that one step further, um, you know, the brushless motor that's provided in that piece of equipment is, you know, one of the most impressive pieces of uh, electrical equipment I've ever encountered. It's very simple. It's very easy to use. It's not very complicated, but it delivers a very high performance. So I'm, I'm very comfortable saying that somebody who knows this fishery well uh, or doesn't know the fishery at all, that that's a wonderful reel to start with. And um, even though we've been doing it 15 years, we still you know, have a couple of them on the boat every time we go out. Uh, so what, so it's, it's the ratings here have it at 40, 50, 65 and 80 pound braid. Mm -hmm. What's your, is it 80, 65? What are you guys using most of the time? So if you're fishing in an area with higher current, you want to have something with a little bit of a less diameter of a line. So I would say like 65 max quattro would be the lightest we would go. Although there are some people that are out there testing lighter stuff. I would say 65 or 80, or if you're in the Northeast, hundred pound would be um, sufficient. So somewhere in that range, 65 to hundred would be more than enough to tackle this fish on this reel. Yeah, so you could go 80 pound max quattro, which has the diameter pretty much of 65 pound regular Power Pro. Correct. And that's 1,260 yards, mm -hmm. right? So that's what, 3,720 feet, something like that? More than enough, more than enough, especially if you're fishing with a, you know, up to a 10 pound lead, it's not, it's not a problem. Okay, and so that thinner diameter, that's an important point because we do it for everything, even including in freshwater. You know, you want a crankbait to run deeper, run a thinner diameter line. Mm -hmm. So you're saying to get the sway out of your line in those heavy current areas, dropping in diameter does help quite a bit, doesn't it? Max Quattro is uh, definitely something that's a that's a game changer. Um, we do like the Max Quattro. I do like the regular Power Pro. I also like the Super Slick. I also like um, a host of other lines for different applications, but. The Max Quattro is a hard line to beat, um, just because of its thinness and its and its strength. Um, so the eighty pound Max Quattro can certainly be a rep, you know, a replacement for the sixty five pound, um, all around great line. But you really can't go wrong with almost anything you put on this reel. Um, but if I had to choose one line, I would say eighty pound Max Quattro would probably be a line that would, you know, be able to tackle almost anything you're going to hook in the ocean, from giant tuna to you know, a swordfish of upwards of four or 500 pounds. Okay. And then for, from what I've seen and what I've gathered from this, it's, it's an electric reel. Uh, the fight is done from the gunnel on a bent butt rod. Most of the time, is it not? Uh, yeah, but you can turn this reel off and fight it with a hand crank. No problem. We've done that too. And uh, you know, that can be, that can be very sporting and very fun. So I would say somebody picking up this reel, if, if you don't want to fight it electrically and you want to have, uh, a more of a sporting fight with it by all means just turn the reel off and start hand cranking with it yep we've done that a handful of times and it's very exciting and very fun and in fact 
Uh, a lot of times the swordfish, unlike a lot of other fish, will, will throw a lot of curveballs at you at the end of the fight. And I find it very useful to be able to just unplug the reel and walk around the boat and follow the fish with the reel. So that's a very unique feature is it's just a few turns on the bottom and you're able to pick that reel up and use it as a manual reel, um, you know, which definitely puts the game in your favor um, with this very tricky fish to land. Okay. And so we chatted when you joined us and you were in and out with, uh, when we were talking with Captain Jack as well, um, we mentioned baits and it's, it's, it's pretty, it's an important factor. And I think it's something you spent a ton of time doing. Mm-hmm. So for someone going out there, they've got a, you know, a bent butt rod, they got it rated properly. So a deep drop rod, actually, before we go to that, what's the characteristics of these rods? Are they a softer tipped rod with more backbone? The rods that you're looking for when you're doing deep drop? That's a really good question, JP. So my answer to that is it's a, it's why it, it, there really is no wrong reel or rod to use with, with a Beastmaster. Uh, I would say that the rod is more perfectly patched with paired with the weight you're using. So if you're in an area where you're using say 10 pounds of lead, you're going to need a rod that's going to be able to fish and be able to support 10 pounds of lead. Um, If you're fishing in an area where there's a lot less current, you can get away with a softer rod. Um, You can put this reel on almost any of the rods that Shimano offers or a custom rod, and it'll perform fine. Um, But it's more about the weight you're using. Okay. So, you know, rod weight, there's a direct correlation in deep dropping, especially when you get into depths deeper than a thousand feet. It's all about the lead. Okay, well, it's, and it's no different. Like I said, in the freshwater world, our rods are rated for based on the lures they're going to be casting. Your rods for deep drop are rated for the weight that you're going to be hanging, basically. Correct. Uh, so, okay, so coming to bait and rigging, um, is there uh, readily available commercial baits? Because I know you do your own, you dye your own, you do all these things. Uh, or are you best served to learn, find on YouTube videos, uh, or, you, or, you know, go out with a guide who, does sword fishing to learn about rigging baits. What's what's the deal with the baits? There is no wrong answer to that. Um, <laughs> and and with that, you know, this opens up a whole nother discussion as far as, um, you know, what works for some people isn't going to work for another. Um, and there's always the, you know, there's always the, the, the ability for people to grow in the fishery. And I think, when you're starting out, it's always important to find like a local guide who's really proficient in the sport in your area, learn it from him, and then kind of modify it to your um, expertise level. Um, so on the beginner level, I would say, you know, companies like Bait Masters, companies uh, that offer a pre-rig bait, that would be a great way for you to start. And as you progress in your ability to get fresh bait, depending on where you're fishing, um, that that's really going to be something that that's going to be dictated on, on your skill set. So um, there's stuff for beginners. You can get as expert as you want. Um, and I would say to the guys that, that really, you know, want to bring their game to the next level, the fresh is better. So um, if you can try and just walk the docks and try and find some people that are out there fishing every day, fresh is always better. And it seems like every single year there's always a new hot bait. Um, so you know, from where we've come to where we've gone, it always goes in a full loop. And the sim, you know, just keep it simple, stupid. E- just keep it easy. Keep yeah. it simple. The more complicated you make it, the more complicated it is. It doesn't need to be that complicated, but it's all about presentation. And you know, make it simple. Be confident in what you're fishing. Is it the bellies you guys are using and stitching up? Uh, is there a preferred species of fish? I know I've I've heard mahi. A lot of times is a great one. Are there specific ones if you're walking the dock and you see people coming out from a day or charter or whatever that you say, I'll take that or you want to stay the hell away from that because they won't eat it? It all works. Um, you know, a bait like a dolphin or a mahi belly is a great bait. The problem is in areas like up in the Northeast where you have a lot of squid in that depth, which is what they eat most of the time. When you present a soft bait like that down in those depths, it's going to get eaten by critters. So I would say one of the baits that I've really tried to drive a lot of people closer to using is eels. 
Um, and the reason is because they have a very thick skin. They're very hard to destroy. They're very simple to rig and they look very natural and they swim great without having to do too much alteration to it. When you get a belly or a side, it requires a lot of stitching. It requires a lot of manipulation to make it perfect. And yeah, those baits can definitely perform. But at the same time, you take that bait up in an area like the Northeast or any, you know, maybe even the Carolinas or sometimes a lot of times Florida. Um, when you have a big population of squid, they're going to eat that bait. And that bait's not going to work for you because it's going to get eaten almost instantaneously um, in a lot of areas where there's just a lot of bait. So an eel's a great, a great bait for this fishery. Easy to get. A lot of distributors can get them. There's a lot of artificial baits that look similar to an eel. Um, but the reason I like the eels, just because it's so simple to use, it works in so many different areas, and uh, it's very difficult for critters that are down there that, that, that are also feeding uh, to destroy. And, um, you know, uh, if the bait's down there getting eaten up, it's very difficult to catch a fish on a bait that's destroyed. So an, an eel's a great bait for anyone, whether you're an expert just getting into it, that, 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 that's definitely a bait that I've pushed a lot of people um, to try to get a little more confident with. Okay. And so, uh, rigging, explain, explain to me the, the deep drop rig, 10 pounds of lead on the bottom, hook up the line. What is it? Is it similar to that or what are you doing? So the reel spooled from the bottom to the top with braided line. And the serving end of that is usually uh, finished with a, with a, we like to say a 42 turn bimini twist on the braid. A little bit more twists in the braid, but by adding more twists in the braid, you're giving that knot a little bit more rigidity. Uh, and then you're going to add a, uh, a wind-on leader. We, we make a lot of our own wind-on leaders. We sell them around the world. Uh, they're available at Hooker. They're available uh, you know, through a host of other distributors. But um, the wind-on leader is a big portion of the rig. Um, now, on the wind-on leader, uh, you'll have a connection where you can add your leaded weight. Um, we like to add ours about 10 or 15 feet down the line so that if there's a tangle or something, it's not going to affect the braid. Um, and depending on the current speed, that's how long uh, the mono leader will be. So if you are in a less current area, call it like the Northeast or the Gulf, uh, we like to suggest something between 50 and 100 feet. If you're in, uh, say, South Florida or some of the areas where there's a ton of current, we like to say something longer, uh, like 150 feet. Um, and that really allows just, it gives a little bit of stretch in the whole outfit. So if you have, uh, say 1600 feet of line out and you have a hundred foot or 150 foot leader, that's going to be the rubber band in the whole outfit. Um, that stretch is the only stretch you're going to get in that whole section of line. Um, so if you're using the Beastmaster reel, uh, it's important to dictate how much line you're putting on the reel and allow enough room on the reel spool to allow the wind on leader to come back onto the reel. So if you're fishing in South Florida, I would say 65 pound test, 150 pound leader. We like to say 130 to 150 pound mono leader. Uh, if you're fishing in some place like the Gulf or the Northeast, we like to say, put a little more line on the reel, use 80 pound um, and bump it up to say 200 pound. Although 150, 130 has become a little bit more popular because it allows the line to stretch out a little more straight and it gives it a little bit more of a natural presentation. So that's the fundamentals of a daytime swordfish leader. I mean, it's very simple yet it's extremely complicated. And, and I, I think <laughs> it, I, it's just, you know, we, we joke about this at the pro staff summit, which is theory, you know, we're, we're targeting a fish where it's like, I have this idea of how this is going to work. And then you have to go let it play out. And, you know, there's just not a lot of people that are out there doing it. And, you know, I'm always encouraging areas and, and people to create a network where you can talk to people because you're all going to learn from each other. And the more knowledge you have, the better you are all going to be. And there's plenty of fish out there. I mean, you know, there's no shortage of these fish. They're very tricky to catch. The more people you can speak to, the better you're going to get at it. So whether that's California, I know Jim Hendricks. I just send him a bunch of leaders and uh, hopefully he's able to use the Beastmaster on this. But um, you got a question from Jim Hendricks, actually. 
what do you got? Jim, uh, Jim is a editor for uh, Saltwater Sportsman, also a writer for uh, Sport Fishing Magazine. We've been working together for quite some time. He's then, wondering what some of the best artificials for daytime sorting is. I would definitely stay away from artificials in daytime sword fishing. Um, you know, this fish has a very unique jaw and tongue structure. Um, when the fish, even, even though it might be one of the most fierce animals in the ocean, I, I would say that the swordfish is also one of the most gentle creatures uh, when it eats a bait. It has a very uh, uh, strategic and violent hit way it can hit the bait, but but from the top of its bill all the way into its mouth, it's it's almost like the surface of your tongue. Uh, I, I feel like that fish really likes to eat and, and taste what it's eating. It, it can also be really tuned in to you know, if it's snake mackerel or squid or whatever it's eating, it has a very advanced flavor system in its mouth. And we can see that just by looking at the fish on the deck. If you feel your tongue, those taste buds, they exist all the way from the top of their bill into their throat, around their mouth. It's a very delicate creature. And, you know, I, I think these fish uh, really have uh, the ability to flavor taste what they're eating. And if you're presenting something that's not natural or soaked in something, it's not the same thing as feeding them the real thing. So I, I would stay away from um, artificial baits um, and try and give them something that's that's fairly close to what they would be eating in their natural environment. So, you know, eel, squid, dolphin bellies, tuna bellies, something like that. Um, anything fresh, uh, fresh meat. I think that's an important factor in, in being successful in the fishery, or at least that's my level of, 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 of feeling confident when I'm presenting a bait at that depth. Now we've talked before and you've mentioned dyeing the baits. Sure. Mm -hmm. Color. What's the deal? I mean, are these fish color specific? Sure. Uh, you know, I actually have uh, one of my friends here at, uh, at my house in uh, Rhode Island, who's a retinal surgeon and we pull the eyeballs out of these things and he looks at them under a microscope. And uh, I can tell you with confidence that these things can see way better than we can see. Um, and they can hunt in pure darkness. Uh, the size of their eyeball is as big as a wiffle ball. So, you know, just their retina alone is larger than almost a ping pong ball. And uh, I, I think, you know, if they're feeding on squid and the squid are mating and the mating squid are white and red, yeah. Dye your squid red. Try it. You know, a very popular color is green. Uh, for some reason, that color just shows up really well. Another important thing to understand is the bottom of the ocean generally is uh, is white. So if you look at a lot of the rover structure videos of the rovers that study the bottom of the ocean, you'll notice uh, that it's fairly constant, that the bottom of the ocean looks fairly uh, similar to snow. So if you give it something that's contrasting, uh, like green or red, uh, darker colors often tend to do better than, uh, say, like a natural colored white squid. Um, so adding some color to your bait can definitely help. You just have to be careful because, um, you know, we use a lot of food dye. And if you have a boat that has teak, it can uh, destroy the teak. If you're, you know, if you're not careful with it, it can certainly ruin a boat. Um, so if you're going to dye the bait, try and put the dye in the bag and then put the bag right over the side of the boat and try not to get the dye on the boat. But if you're going to try dyes, I would try green and I would try red. All right. Two good suggestions. Now, I'm not sure if I missed it or not, Seth. When you were talking about rigging, mm -hmm. um, hook size, ever important. Sure. Is um, there a style and, and size of hook that you're confident in when it comes to sword fishing? So there's only two hooks that we use in our uh, – on our boat. Um, the first one's going to be a VMC 8700 um, SS. Let me say that one more time. So the VMC hook, uh, the 8700, which is a Southern style tuna hook. Uh, uh, president of that company, his name is Cyril, French fella, super nice. We worked a long time on developing a hook shape um, that we feel is, is, is a perfect hook filed shape for this fishery. It's got a, a two blades on the top and a rolled uh, end on the, on the bottom. Uh, that's a, that's a great, that's a great hook. The 8,700, we only fish it in two sizes, 9 and 10 um, And the other hook we like is the uh, Mustad uh, 7691S. Um, 
There's your 8,700 right there, Seth. Yep, that's that's probably my favorite hook. Okay. Out of, out of the package, it, need, it needs no manipulation. The Mustads need quite a bit of filing to get the tip similar to this tip. Uh, Cyril's done a wonderful job being able to put this hook out there commercially with um, with the hook with the hook shape the way it needs to be because you know people fish for all different kinds of fish. Swordfish is a very unique fish. Um, if you study its jaw, there's a lot of bone in it, there's a lot of skin in it, and that's about it. So you're either penetrating you're either penetrating jaw or skin. And a lot of times you're just getting the skin and the shape of that hook, the shape, the way that it, it, it's filed allows a, a quick penetration, especially when you're fishing almost a quarter mile of line out. All right. So there you go. There's the hook size for that. Uh, okay. So we've talked rod, we've talked reel, we've talked line, we've talked leader, we've talked biminis, we talked weight and we've talked it. Oh, when regards to the weights, you're talking 10 pounds of weight. Are there different shape weights that you guys are using for deep drop? Ones that are more maybe hydrodynamic than others, or is there one, is it all a cylinder? What are you guys using? So if you're getting into this fishery, I would definitely suggest using a lead that number one is skinny enough to fit into a rod holder because a lot of people like to say, you know, I don't really want to spend that much money on lead. I want to just pour my own and I saw something on a forum the other day asking what's the best mold to pour for lead. I would say to you, listen, if you're going to spend that much money going that far out sword fishing, get something that's not going to ruin the boat. And that's going to be stick lead. Um, the other thing that I see a lot of people doing is trying to find a substitute for lead. And you've got to understand that rebar, uh, window sash weights, other things, they're not the same density as lead. So they lose their consistency at that depth. Um, so a 10 pound lead at, at a thousand, 2000 feet is going to remain the same weight. If you take a window sash or if you take something else, uh, it's not going to be the same. And also, um, uh, another thing that we, you know, big mistake that we encountered when we first got into the fishery is if you're using something that's too long and has a tendency to rock in the current, and that will give you like a false looking bite. So if you're using a piece of rebar, that's a great example. If you put rebar down there and you start to bring it up, the rebar will rock and um, it will rock on the way back up and it'll make the rod tip look like it's getting bit when it's not. So stick lead, uh, I would suggest ordering stick lead, um, something that's skinny enough to fit into your rod holder because that's going to be the most secure place to leave it when you're fishing. Something along these lines here, 10 pound deep drop lead, if you're going to pour your own. Is that kind of the, what's the diameter of a rod holder? Is it two inches, Seth? Um, I've seen a couple of different sizes. That's, that's another very important thing that we should touch on, which is um, on your rod holder, this is definitely going to be something that you're going to want to have a stainless steel backing plate or a piece of starboard backing plate or something that's going to give it a little bit more rigidity than just a normal rod holder. Because when you're fighting swordfish with the lead and the amount of force that this fish can put out, um, they have a tendency to pull the screws out of your boat. So make sure that your dedicated swordfish rod holders are something that have a backing plate. Um, the other thing that I would recommend is that it's a swivel rod holder. Um, I like a 15 degree. Some people like a zero degree. I would stay away from a 30 degree. And the reason for that is if you're going to be staring at a rod tip all day, it's much easier to stare at a rod tip that has the backdrop of the sky versus uh, the backdrop of the ocean. Um, I also think you, you know, when you increase, you know, when you decrease the angle of the rod, meaning you're pointing it further up, so 15 or zero degree, um, you're you're much likely, you're much more likely to see the bite as opposed to a 30 degree rod holder. All right. Um, one guy, Richie Rogers, asking a cannonball. So let's just say, no, not the correct lead for daytime sword fishing. We love cannonball leads. I love them. Uh, they're a little bit less expensive um, for deep dropping. We we definitely prefer that lead for something like tile fish or snapper fishing or fishing areas where maybe it's a little bit more rocky and you don't really want to hang the bottom. But a cannonball lead, because of the shape and the resistance that it's going to give you in the water, is not the correct lead for daytime sword fishing. You want a stick lead. You want something that's straight. Um, something that's going to move through the water with very little resistance. 
Um, that's what I recommend. Um, if you're fishing in an area with not a lot of current, not going to make a big difference, but it's definitely going to add a lot more load to the rod. Um, when you're bringing it up from a thousand feet at a higher rate of speed, the cannonball is going to uh, put a little bit more resistance on the rod. And I, I, I really like to see what's happening all the time on the rod tip. Um, uh, and so I would stay away from cannonball leads if you're daytime sword fishing. Deep right. dropping for snappers, no problem, but sword fishing, stick with stick lead. All right. So I know this name, Louis DeFusco. Uh, what's your favorite mainline leader size if you were to choose one for north and south? So okay. I know you touched on it, but let's just refresh here for a second. Um, so you really can't go wrong. We sell a lot of leaders in a lot of different sizes. Um, Louis is one of my fishing buddies that I partner with and fish with in the Northeast Canyons. Uh, he's one of the best guys up here. Um, we collaborated quite a bit um, when it came to unearthing the fishery in the Northeast. And the leader that I thought was the right size for um, the Northeast was the 200 pound leader because you encounter a lot of big eye tuna, you might catch a giant tuna or you might get a giant swordfish. And the 200 pound leader, um, you know, tried and true, it's hard to break. Um, but we are seeing a lot more guys as they get more proficient starting to scale down more and more. So 150, um, 130, 150 being something that's extremely popular now. Um, South Florida, a lot of guys still like the 300 pound, the 250, uh, the 200. But again, I think uh, the more people do it, the more you'll tend to see that the guys that are more proficient and catching fish more often are scaling down further and further and further. And that has to do more with bait presentation. So, um, you know, as the line goes on the reel, it has a certain level of memory to it. And uh, the lighter that line is, the less, um, you know, the less coils it'll have in it. So something like 130 is going to present a bait a lot better than, say, something like 250. Um, so it, it really has more to do with preference and what kind of reel you're fishing and, and some of the current um, – but I would say 200, 150, that, 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 that size is really sunken in to be something that the guys that are really doing well are, are sticking with. 150, 200, um, both south and north. The only difference there is just the leader length. Uh, in the south, we fish them a little bit longer uh, because there's more current. In the north, we fish them a little bit shorter. Uh, so Matt's asking, so fluoro is not necessary? I would definitely stay away from fluorocarbon in this fishery because... Uh, fluorocarbon tends to be a little bit stiffer. Now, I love fluorocarbon. I use it for every fishery, use it for almost everything. This is the only fishery where I do not use fluorocarbon. And the reason for that is if the swordfish comes up and takes a big swing at the bait, I want the line to be as limber as possible because there's a lot of times that the swordfish will come up and attack the bait very violently. And if he swats at the bait, I want the bait to follow through with his bill. So if you're using something like a Jinkai or a Moi Moi, um, the bite leader is different from the wind-on leader. So I was mentioning before that 130, 150, 200 is the wind-on leader. We're pretty consistent with the bite leader. And that's something that we like to fish a 200 pound, 250, 300 pound if you're you know, really hearing of a lot of big fish. Uh, and that's something I really want a limber line not fluorocarbon. All right, Matt, hopefully that helps you, bud. Um, so we're at, Sam's asking about, teach us that knot to hang the weight on. What's so, talking about here? Okay. So where people hang their lead on the, on the leader, um, you should be buying a leader that's designed for daytime sword fishing. And it's going to have two, features to it that are different from any other leader you're going to buy. Number one, it's going to have a braided section. You know, we like to use a 16 carrier line that marries to the monofilament. And then down the leader a little bit should be a wax loop. And you're going to hang your lead on the wax loop with a long line clip. And this is another big thing. We like to tell people, put that long line clip on the wax lead, not on the main line. And that allow you know, if it gets hung up or something happens, um, it'll break away and you'll still have the fish. You don't really want that long line clip sliding down the main leader on the fish's face. So the knot that you hang the weight on 
Um, our leaders that we design have a, you know, it's, I'd say it's about a hundred knots, a hundred half hitches of a 50 pound wax line with a two section of 50 pound wax line that you hang the lead on. So hopefully that answers your question, Sam. All right. I'm trying to find a uh, shot of it here. So I'll keep digging as we ask you questions. So uh, Steve Kennedy is asking, what is special about the 1500 foot mark here in the Northeast as well as Florida? That's a really good question. Um, man, we've pounded these bottoms everywhere from 2000 feet all the way up to a thousand feet or inside of that. Um, I think 1500 feet based on the satellite tag data says that that suggests where most of these fish are spending the majority of their time. But m more specifically, Steve, I would say that 1500 feet is kind of the magic number where we have that transition from continental shelf to continental slope. So you have, um, let me see a better way to describe this. If you're looking at a coastline and you notice where the ocean meets the coast, there's a drastic difference between that interface something about 1500 feet that carries from uh the keys all the way up to george's banks there's something about that depth contour that that's magic to this fish i'm not sure what it is i don't know if it has something to do with um you know factors that we really don't know a lot about but there's something magic about that 1500 foot depth that 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 draws these fish to that number um and, and I really think it has something to do with just the continental slope and its attitude from that depth. They're just, you know, they're, they're happy walking on the, you know, swimming up that depth line and that contour line. And, and that's, that's, you know, any further than that, you start to find mud, any shallower than that, you start to find rock somewhere in there. There's more of an interface. And, and that's, that's typically where we see those fish migrate in that depth zone. All to right. 1600 to 1600 feet. So, 15 15 80 that's that's kind of the magic number so seth i'm just i'm digging here um is this i'm not going to say it's the exact thing you're talking about but is this an accurate depiction of your mainline braid going to your bimini going to your main leader going to your bite leader and then your weight is similar to that um i think what what was being asked uh, by Sam was he said that you had a, there was a special name, a specific name for that knot, this knot right here, the hanging knot that you hang your lead from. Yeah. Um, we call it, I call it the Reese weave. I written, I named that knot after my, my son Reese because, um, you know, about eight or nine years ago when I started putting these leaders out in the commercial market, I needed to come up with a way to attach the lead to the main line. And I came up with a, a knot system that allowed the lead to hang on to the main line without actually making contact with the main line. And when I was fishing things like 130 and 150, I never wanted that long line clip to come in contact with that soft mono. So we created something that comes off the mono like a loop. And that's what the clip gets hung on to. Um, so it's, it's, it's holding on the line firmly, but it's not making contact with the main line. Um, uh, if you go on to, uh, you know, if you just search our, our leaders, three buoys, uh, three buoys, daytime leaders, you should be able to find a, uh, a picture of it. Uh, there's a few other companies that are out there. They're all pretty similar. Um, but, but it's a, it's a pretty straightforward concept. You want, you want the weight to hang on to the line, but you don't want the weight making contact with the main line. All right, there you go. Hopefully that helps you out, Sam. So, uh, we got one from Daniel saying, uh, what about slow troll for swords? Okay. So this is definitely something that's becoming, um, more and more on my radar in areas that I'm still discovering. Um, there's, there seems to be a magic speed and the magic speed is about two miles per hour. Um, and the reason I say two miles per hour and not something like one and a half knots is because when you get below two miles an hour, knots really isn't the correct speed measurement that we should be talking about it's more miles per hour so if you're fishing say somewhere in like the gulf um and you know that there's a pile of swordfish down there i know the guys that are down in the gulf they drop the baits on a much different system the weight system is um 
on the bait. It drops the bait down like a sled. And then the bait and the weight disconnect from each other. And then the bait's just sitting there motionless. Um, that's a great system. However, I like to retrieve all, all of the equipment that I'm putting down there. I don't like to go out there with a whole pile of leads and drop them for the day and then come back with no leads. I like to retrieve everything back. So um, with that being said, I, I always like to attach my lead to my main line and I always like to get it back. Um, but in order to do that effectively and present the bait properly, um, I have to move the bait along at a certain speed. And I feel like the magic speed is two miles an hour. So mile and a half, two miles an hour, uh, whatever you need to do to move at that speed, um, that that's that's where we have much more success. Not just drifting at a half a knot with a static bait. The bait doesn't really look like it's alive at uh, you know at that speed. You want to be bumping the boat forward. You want to be moving the bait so that you're achieving that bait speed. Because down there at the depth, you know those swordfish aren't hunting baits that are not moving. They're hunting baits that are moving around. And especially if the swordfish gets up behind a bait, the bait's going to try and get away from the swordfish. So you want to try and present that bait as naturally as possible. And that bait is moving around. So it's making contact with the bottom. It's coming off the bottom. And then it's moving around. Um, and if you do get a bite and you react to it, oftentimes that fish will, will give you a reaction to that. And that's oftentimes, uh, you know, when the bait goes down the hatch. All right. Um Lots of questions coming in actually now. So Zach is asking, what's the best skirt to use on the baits? Oh, Zach, I still need to send you skirts. Um, <laughs> that may be a reminder for you, Seth. I don't know, but it's possible. It <laughs> um, sorry, Zach. I'm, I'm, I'm getting it to you, bud. Um, so really good question, Zach. Zach's a, a great fisherman out of South Florida. Um, uh there is no wrong skirt to use. Uh, I do like glow skirts. I think they all work. But if I had to choose one, I would say anything with a top and a bottom contrast. So if you have a dark top and a light bottom, that's something that that would look very similar to a natural prey item that they would be eating. If you look at any fish anywhere, most fish have a dark top and a light bottom. Um, and, and the reason for that is, you know, if a predatory fish is looking down, they're looking dark. It it's hard for them to see it if they're underneath it and they're looking up it's light so it's harder harder for them to see it looking up so i like to present a bait skirt that mimics whatever they're eating so snake mackerel is a very popular food item for these fish um so i like a, a, a skirt that mimics a snake mackerel the most a dark top silver bottom and i think the most important part on a bait um is the eyes um, you know all these fish at depth have one thing that's common across the board, and that's that they have very large eyes. Um, all the baits, all the weird critters that we pull out of the swordfish have large eyes. So try and put a skirt on your bait that, that you know, dark top, light bottom, some contrast to it with, with, with some kind of luma eyes. All right. Um, so... Let's talk a little bit, and we touched on this the last time. People, I'm like, I'm seeing the odd question saying, you know, where's the best place to go in Hudson Canyon to try deep drop? But let's talk a little bit about the importance of water temperature. I mean, you're saying down below, it's all the same, but is there all that stuff you guys do for searching out big eye and bait with, you know, water temperatures and everything? Does that play into your decision on where you're going to go, Seth? Um, swordfish is a very seasonal fish. So in the Northeast, it's, it's mainly, you're going to see the majority of those fish show up in uh, August, September, October, November, December. That seems to be the time range when there's, they're, they're migrating through that area. Um, water temperature is, it is a factor, but it also isn't a factor. Um, it is a factor because when the right water temperature is there, you get warmer water temperatures, you get more activity, more life, more squid, more frigate mackerel, more dolphin, more, you know, pelagic species that are traveling at the top level of the surface. Um, however, you know, when you get down to depths of, you know, deeper than 12, 1500, 16, 17, 18, 19, 2000 feet of water, that, that water temperature seems to level out a little bit. And, and it, it, it's in that range of say 52 to 58 degrees. And that, that's fairly constant all the way from Georgia's banks, um, south and into the Gulf. 
at that at that at that depth the water temperature is fairly cold so um water temperature makes a big difference for the pelagics but when you get into swordfish that live on the bottom uh, it, it, it's fairly constant so you know I, I think it's more of a migrational a seasonal uh, thing that you should be paying attention to so you know as the tuna become a little bit more challenging to catch in the fall um that's a great time to start targeting the swordfish just because that's when they're migrating through those areas. Um, water temp, you know, you can look at the ROFs charts all day long and, you know, a host of guys that I fish with all the time, Lou, Jack, a um, couple of other really great fishermen up here. I mean, that's all we do is study water temperatures and interface charts, but chlorophyll charts, oh, you could study this stuff till the, till the cows come home. But at the, at the end of the day, um, the sea surface temperature, is not going to be the 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 ocean bottom temperature. Um, there's going to be about a twenty, if not more, degree swing in 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 the temperature there. So, um, you know, more seasonal to the areas. You know, fall time seems to be when these fish get very active and start to move around quite a bit. You know, and if we just take it one step back, you know. I, I would I would suggest to somebody who wants to study that a little bit more. Why don't you study the squid migrations more than temperature? I mean, when do squid migrate? When do squid spawn? You know, on the moons, and um, what makes squid spawn? That that's something that I'm more interested in than temperature, um, because I think those fish are there. You know, and and they're very you know it's a very unique creature. I mean, they can swim from the surface down to 2000 feet of water and, and guys that have seen this happen, you know, you'll hook a fish, he'll come up to the surface. And then the next thing you know, boom, he'll go right back down to the bottom. There's very few fish in the ocean that are capable of doing that. Um, just from a sheer physiological um, perspective, but you know, also from a thermal perspective, I mean, how many fish can go from say 78 degree water to 52 degree water and do that in a, in a matter of under a minute. Not too many fish that can do that. So, um, you know, temperature is important, but really it, it has more to do with bait concentrations. All right. We got another question from uh, from Louie saying, uh, why do you rest the weight on the bottom when you get a bite? Awesome question, Lou. Um, so Lou and I have a really strong opinion about this, which is, um, you know, and um, there's a professor out of the University of Miami who did a study on um, – ocean sound and when you take water depth at 1500 feet you, you, there's a lot of pressure and sound travels further at depth so when the weight hits the bottom at 1500 feet the sound travels much further than it does on the surface so think about being in the woods and you hear a shotgun how far can you hear that shotgun well that's amplified as you go deeper with more pressure so you know, Lou and I, you know, there was one study that we were chatting about where whales can communicate with each other from almost across, across the globe. But the only way that they're able to do that is by going to depths of deeper than 1,000, 2,000 feet of water. And it's the same thing with, you know, swordfish are very curious creatures. So if you can get the lead on the bottom and make contact, it's going to put really like a big bang out that they're going to come and look for. So to answer, you know, not to answer, but really just to to you know, reiterate what Lou's saying there is, it is so important to constantly make contact with the bottom. And um, you know, when you're bottom fishing, just putting a noise out that they can come and track. Um, they're very curious creatures, and if you, the more noise you can make, the more chance you have to call them into the bait. Great. All right, that's a lot of information here. All right, so um, anything you want to touch on here, Seth? We've already done 54 minutes, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> goes by like this. Goes lights. Like this. Um, lights. I, I like a disco light. I like the white light. I like a green light. I like a blue light. Um, color combinations. Try and change it up. Um, uh, as soon as you said it, first question: Can you talk about lights? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, white lights, green lights, blue lights, and disco lights. Um, I, I would say that I, I often. Uh, very important thing. If I can just leave it at this, you're going to spend all this money on the reel. You're going to spend all this money online on fuel, time invested. 
Every time I go out, I put on fresh lights. No questions asked about that. I don't reuse my lights. I use them once and then they get moved over from my swordfish bag to my deep drop snapper or, or grouper bag. Um, Every time I'm going sword fishing, I'm always using two fresh lights. And the only lights that I use is LP lights. The LP Duraloom lights are the only lights that I use. Um, there's a lot of knockoff cheaper brands out there that you can find on the internet. Um, but there's something about, you know, that's a commercial fishing company that produces a very um, quality product. And, um, you know, invest the $11 in buying a brand new light each time you go deep dropping. Considering the fuel you're spending, the 11 bucks should be the least of your concerns. Yeah, 22 bucks go buy two brand new uh, lights every time you do this. Uh, that, that's a very important thing. And the other thing you shouldn't skimp on is the swivels. Um, you want to make sure you're using a double barrel um, swivel. Do you have a, a, a type that you use, Seth? Uh, the VMCs are my favorite. The VMC, I'm not exactly sure the size, but I want to say that the poundage is like uh, 320 pound. But this, the, the, the VMC... Um, swivels, um, in the box, um, no, stainless steel rolling. Correct. I think Spro makes one. Uh, Sam Pro makes one. Um, Malin makes one. Uh, there's a couple of companies that make it. But if you look at the swivel, um, you know a good quality swivel is going to range from eight dollars to fifteen dollars per piece. Um, the most important piece about the swivel is that both sides independently swivel from each other. And, and I've, I've seen a few people that I, that I consider, you know, fairly proficient, but the big mistake that I see them making is they're using like an Aussie swivel. Uh, it's very important to be using a ball barrel, a, a ball bearing swivel. No compromising there needs to be a, a dual action ball bearing swivel. All right. Um, talk about, okay. This is, here's the one from Steve again. So the nighttime swords have come to boat pretty much done. Uh, so a gaff or two. To, oh, okay. He's saying at night they come to the boat pretty much out of out of energy, it sounds like. Uh, so a gaff or two does the deal. How does this differ from daytiming, uh, i.e. harpoon? So is it different, like boating a nighttime sword versus a daytime sword? Um, I, I, I think the guys that are... I think the guys that are really good at sword fishing understand that this is a fish you want to harpoon and let kind of calm down with a harpoon in it. Don't gaff the fish, harpoon the fish. When the fish is extremely calm and docile, gaff the fish. Um, don't start with the gaff and then try and harpoon it. Uh, there was a great video that was posted on a forum the other day of a couple of, uh, a couple of hot dogs that had two gaffs and a swordfish, and it looked like it destroyed the transom of the boat. Uh, beat the hell out of the two guys and um, destroyed the fish. I mean, it's a very, very fragile fish. I would say that swordfish, um, when you harvest the fish, has the consistency of a pumpkin. Um, you can stick your finger right through it. Um, harpoon the fish, let them calm down. When the fish is very, you know, manageable, then you gaff the fish. Um, but I would say, you know, if sword fishing is going to be something that you want to get good at, you want to carry two harpoons, um, and the most Are you boys you know, at all, Seth. Say again. Are you running boys? No, no. We run two baskets. Uh, each basket has twelve hundred feet, um, and the reason I say that is because we harpoon the fish, and a lot of times the fish will dash right back down to the bottom with all the dart rope with it. It's not like giant tuna fishing where you're going to hit it and it's going to take a bunch of line and, and calm down. Um, swordfish are very resilient animal. Um, a lot of times, the less you pull on it, the easier they are to get to the boat. But once they get to the boat, once you engage that fish, he's going to come alive. So, you know, a friend of mine said, catching big fish is an art, but killing big fish is, is, is an art in of itself. It's extremely dangerous fishery. Um, 1,200 feet, two baskets. I can't tell you how many times I've went through two baskets on one fish where we had to clip one basket to the other basket just because that's how much line the fish wanted to take out. Um, in your fish that are under 300 pounds, it's probably not going to come into play. But if you're not prepared for that fish, that's going to be 400 plus pound fish. You're never going to, you're never going to get that fish into the boat unless you're prepared for it. And the only way that that's going to happen is if you have two baskets, 1200 feet per basket, 
And, and, and that's how you're going to break that record of, you know, 1100 pounds plus. You need to be prepared for that fish because four baskets, four baskets. You know, two baskets is fine, but you know, three barrels. She'll never take down three. <laughs> so All right, two, last two questions here. Uh, Matt's asking, do you ever plan your daytime sword trips around the moon rise or other moon phases? Um, well, you can't, weather. you can't catch them if you don't go. Um, weather. Yes. Weather is a factor. Absolutely. Back home in Florida, you know, it's only a 14 mile run for me to go sword fishing, which is you know, one of the reasons we were able to get good at it quickly is because you can leave at three o'clock and go fish for a few hours and come home. Um, on the moon, uh, a guy that, that fuels our boats used to own a, um, a, a long line boat. And he, he dropped a very interesting piece of information on me. And that was on the full moons, he fished in Florida on the new moons. He fished in Charleston. Um, is there something to that? I don't know, but I know that these fish eat every single day. Um, it might just be different. The time is of the day that they eat. So, I don't think that uh, the moon phase matters as much uh, as just being out there and trying to be persistent, you know, persistent with presenting baits. So I like the full moon. I, I definitely like the week leading up to the full moon. I feel like these fish are a little more active uh, and that's because the squid are more active. There's more food for them to eat. All right. And last one, Louie again, and this is interesting pumpkin, right? You hear the word pumpkin, you hear the word regular swords uh what percentage of fish in florida are pumpkin that i guess that's for those who don't know that bright orange meat that looks similar to pumpkin flesh uh versus regular sword what percentage uh, i'd say one in ten ten percent of our fish in florida are pumpkins um and i would say that 50 percent of the fish over 300 pounds are pumpkins really yeah um, and, and how does this differ from the northeast uh, I don't. I don't think there's as many uh, congregations of, 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 of ruby red shrimp in the Northeast. So, you know, it's just like a flamingo. When uh, fish get into a big pile of shrimp, um, their skin or their meat can turn a different color, um, and that's mainly because of the iodine in their diet. Uh, up in the Northeast, if you look at their diet, it's mainly more, um, you know, scaled fish and squid. Um, so you're not really going to see as many pumpkin fish because there's just not a big uh, congregation of ruby red shrimp. Uh, as you get down into the Gulf, if you, we look at a lot of the fish that are in the Mediterranean, if we look at a lot of the fish that are, um, you know, swinging up the Florida coast through the Bahamas, there's a lot more ruby red shrimp. Uh, and when they get into a plume of those and they eat tons of them, uh, their skin can turn and the meat can turn, um, you know, much more bright uh, orange color. It's also important to understand that, you know, if you do catch a pumpkin swordfish, you can't feed that fish to somebody who could be uh, iodine deficient. So somebody that's allergic to shellfish, you can't serve them uh, pumpkin swordfish. They, they could potentially have a reaction to that. Interesting. All right. So there you have it, folks. Um, Seth, I'm going to hope we can talk to you again about doing some more deep drop stuff in the near future. Uh, that was a, a ton of information. I just want to take the time to thank everybody for joining us tonight for Shimano School, obviously both on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. Uh, if you can, click the share button. That helps us get the word out. This information will be living here, so you can always access it, uh, You know, research it. If you forget about it, send a buddy there. Just a great way to touch up and learn the basic fundamentals. Uh, maybe we go a little further into it, a little more into the theory next time, Seth. I know you love sticking your nose into the theory of these things. So uh, we can definitely do that the next time. So again, thanks for your time. Man. <laughs> so, thanks, dude. I really appreciate it to everybody who joined us tonight. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll be coming back uh, maybe in a week or two where we'll post on Facebook when the next Shimano school is. So everybody have a great night. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, JP. You're the best.